Welcome to the third and last day of our Congress. We will start over the history and tradition of martial arts. We will pose questions after the each speech. If you have any, please write them in the comment section underneath our stream. We will start with Master of Arts, Aaron Shamodi. I hope I pronounced your name correctly, from Edward Schlerand University in Budapest, Hungary, presenting a speech, Concept of Fencing Theory, in Judaism, Jin Jing, and their parallels in historical, uh, historical European fencing system. Um, Mister, do you need anything? Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you. I will start sharing my screen, and I hope it will work. Just a moment. Okay. Can you see my screen now? I think yes. We can, we can see our screen. And can you hear me properly? Mm, yes. Okay, thank you. Yes, can, we can see you and hear you. Okay, thank you. So then I will start my presentation. So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for having me here at the uh, Brocklav Chinese Martial Arts Congress. My name is Aaron Shomodi, and uh, I'm a PhD student uh, at the Sinology Doctoral Program of Epesh Florand University. My main field of research is uh, Ming Dynasty Martial Arts Manuals. And uh, I'm also a historical European martial arts practitioner and instructor. So today I brought you a topic uh, that is a little bit uh, from both fields and uh, I hope uh, I can share some interesting uh, information with you uh, about the similarities uh, between different fencing sy systems around the world. So uh, just a brief overview of my uh, presentation. First, I will give you a little introduction to the famous Ming Dynasty fencing manual, the Tian Ting. I'm sure that uh, many of you Chinese martial arts enthusiasts are already familiar with this work, so I will only uh, talk about it briefly. Then uh, I will uh, share with you uh, the main, uh, most important theoretical fencing theoretical concepts that uh, we can find in this work. Uh, which is uh, very interesting uh, uh, because it uh, gives us uh, an insight into Ming Dynasty uh, fencing master's uh, way of thinking about fencing. And uh, finally, uh, I will uh, show some parallels to you uh, to these theoretical concepts uh, that can also be uh, found in the European historical fencing systems. So let's start uh, with the, the historical background of the Tian Ting, or Sword Treatise, as uh, we can translate its title. Uh, it was created during the Ming Dynasty, uh, which uh, is uh, traditionally uh, usually called as the Golden Age of Martial Arts. And uh, we can say it's a well-deserved uh, title, because this age was uh, very violent. Uh, Armed violence was on every level of society. Uh, there were uh, wars against uh, outer enemies. Uh, there were uh, local uprisings. There were banditry everywhere, clan feuds. So uh, uh, indeed, there were lots of violence and lots of martial artists uh, during this age. Uh, this is uh, also a period uh, when uh, the Chinese literary culture uh, really started to flourish and uh, more literary works uh, were created in this period than ever before in the Chinese history in very diverse and different topics like uh, many professionals started to write books uh, about their own fields and military professionals and martial artists uh, were no exceptions so uh, there were many uh, military encyclopedias and martial arts manuals created in this period. In fact, uh, this is the first period of Chinese history uh, that we have extant martial arts manuals from. And uh, one of these martial arts manuals uh, is the Tian Ting or Sword Treatise, 
which was uh, written by the famous Ming Dynasty general Yu Daio, uh, who uh, very effectively fought uh, the Voko pirates in southern China. And after his successes, he wrote this essay about uh, fencing. But in fact, uh, his uh, work was preserved in another uh, huge work, the first uh, Ming Dynasty military encyclopedia, the Qi Xiao Xin Shu, or New Treatise on Military Efficiency, which was compiled uh, by Yu Dao's colleague and friend, Qi Qi Kuang. Uh, Qi Qi Kuang included several martial arts manuals into his work, and uh, one of these uh, was Yu's Treatise, uh, most likely because uh, it's a very comprehensive work on fencing, including uh, a lot of uh, theoretical teachings and explanations, unlike uh, uh, other works from this period. So uh, this is what makes the Tianqing so interesting and so important for Chinese uh, martial arts history, because this is... Uh, mm, almost the only work uh, from the period uh, which uh, contains uh, a lot of fencing theory. Uh, just a little addition, uh, which is, uh, I think, interesting, that uh, this uh, martial arts manual, the Tianqing, uh, despite its name, which contains sword, is not a sword fencing manual, but a staff fencing manual. And there are several theories about uh, why did you uh, give uh, this uh, title to his work. Most likely because the Tian was a dated but uh, prestigious weapon of the elite at that age. So uh, giving a title like this uh, gave more prestige to his work. Uh, but technically it's a staff fencing manual. And you explains us, as you can see here in this uh, quotation, why he chose the staff uh, for the basic training weapon to his teachings. Uh, because he thought that uh, if a pupil learns to uh, fence, uh, learns the main fencing principles uh, with the staff, then they can adopt it uh, to any other bladed or pole weapon. And uh, also the staff is a very uh, easily uh, manufacturable and uh, cheap weapon, so it was available uh, in a wide scale. I brought some uh, examples uh, from the Tianqing as it is compiled into the Qi Xiao Xin Shu, just uh, uh, if uh, there are some of you who, who haven't uh, seen it before. The first picture uh, is uh, uh, from the beginning of uh, the treatise, uh, it describes some uh, basic teachings and some basic theoretical concepts. The second one is a diagram which uh, teaches uh, the proper hand positions uh, when uh, we uh, fight with the trident. And the third is one of the many illustrations that were attached uh, to the Tianqing, but uh, these were not part of the original work. These were created by General Qi Qi Kuang when he compiled uh, the Tianqing into his encyclopedia, uh, most likely because he wanted to give further explanations uh, to the text. Just a few words about the structure of the Tianqing. Uh, it has three main parts. The first one contains uh, basic teachings uh, from body postures and footwork to basic theoretical concepts of fencing, and uh, they are in the form of uh, mnemonic verses, uh, which are easily memorizable little verses, and they are called Zongtiege uh, in the work. And these verses are intertwined uh, with two passages of solo training drills, drills uh, one with the trident and uh, one with the spear. The second uh, bigger part of the work is uh, the list of uh, the basic techniques that uh, you included into the Tianqing. Uh, these are the names and the brief explanations of uh, basic uh, attacking movements, strikes, thrusts, uh, covers, and parries. Uh, it's like a catalog. And the third part is the largest of uh, the three. Uh, it contains 154 paragraphs of fencing plays. 
uh, these are like step-by-step uh, -step instructions uh, for different situations a fencer can find themselves in. Uh, and uh, it really uh, is a great manual, like it describes if your enemy does this and this, then you do that and that and that, and then you can win the fight. And uh, these instructions, these uh, fencing plays are also intertwined with some paragraphs of sorry, explanations of fencing theory. So most of the theoretical content uh, can be found scattered in these uh, paragraphs. Uh, so for a modern reader, uh, this work is a little bit uh, uh, hard to read and uh, uh, doesn't seem too well edited. But of course, uh, for uh, its uh, own period, it was a great essay. Before I start to uh, uh, talk about uh, the fencing theoretical uh, part of the Tian Ching, I would like to define what I mean by fencing theory. And I will use the words of Guy Windsor, who's a great uh, researcher of historical martial arts, both Western and Eastern. And he uh, explains it as uh, fencing theory is the intellectual abstract structure that fencers use to describe, define, and explain their art. Or uh, with other words, if I like to put it in a simpler way, uh, because fighting is a very chaotic act. Uh, if we want to be proficient and effective in it, we have to create a, a framework. We have to find some patterns uh, to, to bring order into this chaos. And the tool of uh, this is uh, fencing theory. So I uh, brought some uh, quotations from the Tian Ting about uh, the, one of the most important uh, theoretical aspects uh, that you uh, describes in his work. And uh, it's the time aspect of fencing. And as you can see, all these quotations uh, point in the same direction. These are from different parts of the work. But uh, all of them says, like, who hits later achieves victory earlier. Uh, you should know this well. You can never injure someone with only one hit. So this is a tactical mindset, uh, which uh, by modern fencing terminology, uh, we usually call secondary intention offense. And this means that uh, the actions of the fencer, uh, their first or first few actions uh, do not aim to make a direct hit by the first, uh, first strike, but uh, the first few actions are uh, provocations that are aimed uh, to make an opening on the enemy's defense. So after that, we can safely uh, make a hit uh, on the enemy. Uh, so this is a very important uh, theoretical part of your system that uh, uh, it uh, prefers secondary intention offense. There is also a term here at the end of the uh, first quotation, the gentleman fights with the knowledge of the Pi Wei. And this term Pi Wei, which uh, we can uh, uh, explain as the place of the beat in the uh, music or in songs, uh, this is a very important concept in the uh, youth system because uh, there's a technique uh, which he calls dung and uh, he explains it as the peak of fencing, the highest level. If someone can uh, execute this technique, it's uh, the peak of fencing knowledge. And this highway, uh, which is uh, uh, something like the correct moment, uh, the exact moment when uh, someone has to execute the technique. Uh, this is the requirement of the proper execution of the dung. So what is the dung? Uh, we can see uh, that the first uh, quotation that I wrote is a little bit obscure, uh, but the second one is uh, uh, more understandable. When the highway is established in the middle, do not pull, shave, cover, or let your weapon fall. Just throw a thrust and do it in a really tight manner. So this technique is basically uh, something uh, like a single uh, tempo parry and attack, uh, 
one movement, which is a parry and a counterattack at the same time. And uh, you teaches us that uh, we, uh, when the enemy attacks us, we shouldn't do uh, any fancy technique, we shouldn't parry, we shouldn't uh, retreat. Uh, we just throw our weapon into the enemy's attacking movement and do it fast and uh, uh, in a really tight uh, movement. And uh, this technique is uh, what I find uh, in many, many, many other fencing systems of different ages uh, and cultures. Uh, in fact, it can also be found in some boxing systems. Uh, but uh, I will only show you some European uh, historical examples of it. But before, uh, yes, here you can see uh, the illustration to this technique. As you can see, the fencer on the right uh, executes the technique. He attacks right into the uh, strike of his enemy and uh, he, he wins the center line. And uh, uh, with one movement, he throws a thrust. Uh, to the enemy's head or chest. So before I uh, show you the uh, European examples of the same technique, the same principles, I would like to uh, briefly define uh, what I mean uh, by this technique, what are the main common aspects that we can find in this technique, uh, which uh, uh, I think uh, the most well-known name of this technique in the West is Absetzen, which is coming from the German fencing schools. So uh, it is important that it is a counter-attack, but also a parry, and it is only one movement. Uh, there is no a separate parrying move. The second important thing is uh, uh, there must be a contact established between uh, my and the enemy's weapon. And uh, it must be established uh, in a manner that uh, uh, the point of contact on my weapon is closer to my body than the point of contact on the enemy's weapon, uh, which should be farther from uh, their body. So I can push away their weapon without uh, any uh, uh, high effort. It is very easy to push it away with a tight movement. And which is also important that uh, this movement should be uh, very fast, straight uh, and tight. And it is usually ended with a thrust. So let's see the examples. Uh, in the fencing uh, tradition of uh, the famous German master Johannes Lichtenauer, we can uh, find in the earliest source uh, in the uh, Nuremberg Hausbuch, uh, this uh, explanation for the technique called absetzen, which is uh, almost the same as the dung, learn to set aside to skillfully hinder stroke and thrust. Who thrusts at you, your point hits and counters his. Uh, it's a little bit obscure, but uh, uh, it is very similar to what you explains in the Tianting. And if we have a look at this illustration to the absetzen, it is very, very similar to what we can see in the Tianting, uh, like the fencer on the right uh, wins the center line, pushes away uh, the weapon of the enemy and thrusts into his face in one single movement. We can also see this technique uh, in uh, the art of uh, Fiora dei Liberi, uh, the famous medieval uh, Italian fencing master. He calls it the exchange of points or exchange of thrusts. And uh, he describes it like, when your opponent thrusts at you, quickly advance your front foot of the line and with the other foot step to the side, also moving off the line, crossing his sword with your hands low and with your point high into his face or chest. As you see drawn here, I show you the illustration. Uh, the only difference from the previous uh, descriptions is uh, Fiora has a different footwork, but the uh, basic principle of the technique is the same. And uh, here's my third example from the 16th century Iberian fencing master Domingo Luis Godinho, who uh, taught uh, fencing with the side sword. And uh, what, is, what is interesting uh, in his system is uh, that uh, he uses this very same technique and describes it as the most basic form of defense, 
like uh, if someone attacks you uh, with a thrust or with a strike you just do this type of technique which is which we can call up zetsen or dung uh, on the same side on the same height as the attack is coming from and uh, you thrust into it so it's also in one single movement a parry and a counter attack and uh, just to uh, cover up things uh, how can we explain these similarities between uh, different systems of uh, different cultures and times? Of course, there are little differences uh, between uh, the description of this technique, uh, because different systems have different cultures of movement, uh, they have different ways of understanding uh, fencing theory, but in its very uh, basic principle, it is the same technique. So why is it possible that we can find it uh, in several different places? Uh, well, most likely because uh, human uh, anatomy, human biomechanics and uh, uh, physics have uh, their own rules. And uh, because of this, there are only a limited number of ways to use a weapon effectively. So because this technique works really well and uh, uh, and it's very effective. It's no wonder that uh, several traditions uh, found it, invented it, and uh, used it uh, in their systems. I hope you found it interesting. Thank you so much for your attention and for having me here. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions, I would be very happy to answer them. We have one question for you. Thank you so much, Mr. Arshamadi. Uh, that bit you need to work according to how is it learned? The method of learning that bit while learning the system. Excuse me, could you repeat, please? Because I, oh, I didn't okay, no problem. Uh, that bit you need to work according to how is it learned? The method of learning that bit while learning the system. I'm I'm not sure I <laughs> I understand the question. So you have to learn the beat, or or how, how do you learn the beat? Like I I guess the beat. About oh it. yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> I I understand. Sorry. Yes. Uh, so yeah, it uh, it needs. Uh, I mean, uh, the the beat is uh, the timing. Uh, the timing is the most important part of it. As as you said, it the pive is uh, the correct moment. And uh, I think a fencer needs a lot of experience, uh, a lot of uh, knowledge about uh, distant man distance management and timing to properly execute this technique. So it, it uh, sounds easy on paper, but uh, it uh, needs a very accomplished fencer to properly execute this technique. I, I hope I, uh, I answered the question. Okay, thank you. We have another one question. Uh, following the manual, can we observe the Sun Tzu art of war influence uh, uh, in fighting philosophy? No, I don't think so. Uh, we can find some uh, terms that are familiar from uh, from ancient uh, military uh, strategic manuals and from Taoism. Uh, but uh, these uh, were parts of uh, the common uh, military vocabulary at the time. So I, I don't think it's a direct influence. It's, it's more like uh, a custom to, to use these, uh, these terms by military professionals of that age. Okay, thank you. I think this is all. Uh, thanks, thank you once again for your speech, uh, Mr. Arshamodi. And now Thank we have our much. break.
next is uh, Mr. Gabriel Guarino de Almeida, PhD student in education from um, Pontifical Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro, presenting a speech, Humanity and Animality in Chinese Martial Arts. Uh, Mr. Do you need anything? Good morning, good morning, you all. Can you hear me? Just testing the audio. Uh, yes, you can hear you. <laughs> Uh, great, great. I I start to share my my presentation. It's going to be here on my side, so everyone can uh, follow with me the the steps. Good morning, everyone. Thank you again for the opportunity to give this speech. Uh, may I start? Yes, you can start. <laughs> oh, great, great. Uh, once again, thank you all. It, is, it has been a wonderful uh, discussion since Friday. I've been um, watching the videos, not, not always live, since we are just a little ahead of time. Here in Brazil, it's like five and a half in the morning. So good morning in the early morning for everyone. It's been a pleasure to be here. I'm Gabriel Guarino. I'm PG candidate at puc -Hill. I'm just like on my own going research on Tai Chi Chuan. And this is a topic that I will share with you today is a kind of uh, an outcome of the research that I've been doing, uh, specifically regarding this problem of humanity and animality in Chinese martial arts. The first thing I want to say is to, uh, to remember that my, my speech is going to be just uh, a small amount of the whole text of the essay so if you have any further question you can contact me after or make the question here in the chat so we can uh, further our investigation together this um, presentation here is going to be just a kind of um, reminder for me what I've, i'm going to say so is better focus on the speech itself than the, the figures here. So the figures it can help our understanding. My question begins with uh, a common question as a martial art practitioner, which is why do we have so much animal references in Chinese martial arts? This uh, always kept me wondering why do we have uh, these imitation styles itself, but not only uh, to think about the eagle claw, the praying mantis, the tiger, the drunken boxing itself was also the sort of imitation style if we, if we take a look, but also the references. Like we do have a, a great number of postures that we have animal names. Sometimes we are the, the Baihali and Chi, we are the, the, the bird open its wings. And then in another time we are the tiger, in another time we are the the monk defeating the tiger and so on. And then these questions move me to a kind of a philosophical uh, research in a, in a very profound dialogue with the contemporary anthropology, which has been my theoretical background, most of my research. So um, the question is, why do we imitate animals in Chinese martial arts? And this question uh, raises two, two other questions, which is first one, if you take a, a, a very specific form of, of formulate the problem, I might ask, what's the nature of the imitations of animals in Chinese martial arts? And then for nature here, we also have a question, which is what nature means in this Chinese context of spreading uh, Chinese martial arts? And most of all, how is the status of uh, the human being uh, inside this cosmos and inside this specific cosmovision, if we can talk about one Chinese cosmovision or we can talk about many um, traditions, many, line, many lines of thought and so on. So to investigate this question, what's the, the, the meaning, the nature, the, the origin of this uh, animal references, I'm going to take three steps. First, to remember some of my experience as a martial artist and some of my notes of my ongoing ethnogra ethnographic research. Secondly, we're going to take a, 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 a long journey through uh, Chinese philosophy so we can uh, grasp some of uh, references that are important to our investigation. And then 
I'm going to propose uh, an answer to these questions. Uh, what's the nature of this character of this imitation? And then uh, this is, of, of course, uh, one of the possible questions. So you might have a different one, which I would like to know, to share and to listen to. So first, uh, why do we imitate animals? Why do we have like the, the, the prey mantis, the eagle claw, the, the tiger claw and so on, which is when uh, I'm also uh, a martial artist, as I said, I've been practicing eagle claw kung fu through the lineage of the Grandmaster Lili Lau here in Brazil. Uh, actually, my master is based on Rio de Janeiro, where I live, and he's called Alexandre Neto. And then he's a, a disciple of uh, Master Lili Lau. And then we have a close relation to the master because she comes to Brazil very often. And then uh, it's strange because if you have, uh, if you have had any contact with the Chinese eagle claw style as uh, it comes from the Lao Fatima, the Qing Wu uh, Association style. You can see that even though we do have like claws and this reference of the eagle, uh, we barely uh, do like eagle imitation movements and we see some Shaolin performance and so on. And when I moved to my uh, uh, doctorate investigation, I was concerned about the problem of uh, the raising of ethical values through the martial arts practice. And then I came to investigation of the Chen Tai Chi trend, the, 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 the Tai Chi practice in the Chen family. And now I'm currently on the what we would call um, a performance ethnography, right? Where, where I take a stand as a, as a apprentice of Tai Chi Chuan, so I can uh, get myself into the field and really, and really uh, engage in this bodily process to understand its practices. And then I got very happy when I saw this art of, from the, the, the event, because here we can see some uh, patterns of the Tao Lu, of some movements of Chinese martial arts. And then I believe that everyone who, who is watching us now have some idea of how it worked like this this learning process is where we have a choreography of movements and then we uh, practice this and then we have to have a kind of a flow while we're doing it. And then sometimes, depending on the practice that you have, you also have intentions in the movement, which is related to the name of the movement sometimes. I remember having uh, some corrections during my Tai Chi learning, which is like, I was doing like this Chin Chi Tu Li, where we stand with one leg and then we open our arms like this or something like this. And then my professor would say, Gabriel, you have to remember that the, this, uh, this posture in Chinese is like some kind of the independence uh, of, or sometimes in Portuguese, it's as well as the, the rising of the uh, golden uh, Easter. And then I was like, well, the golden rose and the, like, a bird like getting up high and then you have like this idea of, of growing up with the movement which is like concerned somehow the 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 aspect of the of the learning process and then when i moved to a performance ethnography i just like uh, record my uh, research notes my field work uh, transcriptions and my my notes of learning process itself, which gather with my private experience as martial artist to answer this question. Um, and then I, I, I'm really connected to Douglas Father's work, which is a, an anthropologist and a, a fighting scholar also, who has been thinking about like, when the researcher joins and learns a martial arts from the ground up as a basis for writing, research, creation, and their reflexive transformation of self and others. And then in this process of learning, I would recall uh, an experience of mine in the learning of Eagle Claw. This is a, a, a image of a performance of a uh, YouTube uh, video of Master Lili Lau. And she's like doing some very fast Eagle Claw movements with hands, claws, and pa 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 pa. And then I was, uh, when I was trying to answer the question of humanity and animality, I, I came back to some of my notes as a martial art practitioner uh, before I became a, a, an anthropologist engaged, engaged in the field. And then I, I, find, I found out this, this very interesting uh, moment of practice 
when I was in the occasion of my first um, student who was going to, to take a black belt exam uh, under supervision of Master Lili Lau. And then I was performing with him uh, a pair routine when I was with a, a broadsword and he was with, with a spear. And then the routine, it, it calls a, a very fast movement of the broadsword since the spear is trying to reach it and then the broadsword is trying to fill the gap of the distance to uh, make some cut or some uh, very aggressive attack while the, the spear trying to always uh, take a, a further, dis a longer distance to do some uh, cutting and thrusting and so on. And then after the, the presentation that I did with my student, Master Lili Lau would uh, come after me and say like this. She said, oh, very good, Gabriel, very fast, very eagle claw. Eagle claw has to do like this, fast and strong, like an eagle. When she catches, boom, and then she was like showing, like when he, she catches, Boom. And then uh, you're very good because you do the spring. In eagle claw, you have to do the spring like an eagle. And then uh, my English was uh, a, a kind of loss in this conversation. And then I thought about uh, what spring means. I wasn't uh, very, very uh, thoughtful. I couldn't remind the exact meaning of spring. And then I came to my master uh, when I came back to Rio de Janeiro. Uh, and, and ask him, and then I'm sorry for translating Portuguese because this is how he, how he said, but I'm going to translate it. I ask him, Master, how, how, how does the, the Master Lili Lau use this spring thing in, 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 in the process of uh, teaching uh, Kung Fu? And then he said, Gabriel, uh, she always talks that spring is something like um, uh, advance towards the opening. You, you never, you, you always stopped and then you suddenly attacked and you have to be very explosive in your movement. And this is funny because my master doesn't speak English. Uh, and then they have a kind of learning which is um, a, a barely English, a barely Chinese, and then they go like, go on with the, the bodily practice, which is, I, I believe is very common in this, in this process of learning with uh, Chinese masters. Sometimes we don't, we don't get through the language, but it's the, the body language itself. And then I came back to do the, the, this research about um, animality. And then I kept thinking about, well, I'm not imitating an ego itself, but it's something about the quality of um, the ego's movement as an animal that makes sense when I try to fight. And then my master came with this final point of, of his, his speech when he said, have you ever seen Gabriel, an eagle attacking? She catches, the, the eagle catches the, the, I don't know, his prey, and then goes up to the sky and then let it, let it fall in the ground and then eat it. And then all the attack is very fast and very, and very silly movement. And then, I came to a, a dictionary of English nowadays when I was doing like this this essay, and then I came to the, the the this this picture of a spring, which I found very clever and very uh, <laughs> uh, direct explanation. A spring is like a a very fast movement, right? And then I started to think about this uh, this pattern of movement in Chinese martial arts. Sometimes the message will say about Li as the, the ideogram, which is sometimes uh, translated as principle, sometimes as like um, uh, logic, sometimes as pattern, sometimes as uh, natural reason, reason and so on. And then I came back to some old manuals of Eagle Claw and I found a, a very interesting uh, topic, which is we always have sometimes in some um, uh, contemporary, some modern Chinese manuals, this is Yao, sometimes it's uh, Jia Yao, sometimes it's uh, Yao Lung, so, uh, always like an uh, explanation or a discussion of the main points, of the main opinions, of the main principles. Sometimes we translate it like that in Portuguese or to English. And then um, I started to think about uh, how uh, the spring of an eagle in the eagle claw looks like much more a quality of the movement 
than uh, a kind of straight synesthetic of the animal. What I mean? I mean, sometimes we are trying to uh, grasp some way of movement that expresses through the technique, but not that we're going to recognize the animal itself. And then I have some uh, uh, conversation with some uh, Tai Chi Chuan uh, friends and uh, other styles of Kung Fu. And then we, we have a lot of this um, misconception that we are going to always be imitating the animal itself, which sometimes is, is such more uh, an inspiration. We have some tales about the origins of Tai Chi Chuan and many other styles that they recall this observation of the Chinese master, she was like looking for an answer for something and then he saw a, a battle between two animals, two insects, and then he grasps the, the, the pattern of movement. And then here I can come back to my to my question. And then we come when we come back to it, um, I have to again uh, pose this problem. Because when you do, when we go for contemporary anthropology and this debate, it, it reminds us a very strong uh, argument of the Western cosmology and how we, uh, as Westerns, if we can say that, um, think about nature and, and our relation to the cosmos. Because when we have like this Chinese master talking about like an eagle, does, does the master say the same thing that we do when we say that we imitate some animal in a kind of dance, of contemporary dance or so on? And then my paper and my, my presentation has a very, a very first call, which is another essay from an anthropologist called Tim Ingold. And Tim Ingold, he has this humanity and uh, animality, which is the, without in Chinese martial arts, we, I came <laughs> inspiration with the same question because he poses the, the following question. Um, the, the relation of uh, the conception of humanity as a kind of a separate uh, species through the animal kingdom, where we have a kind of a merge of two different things, which is the human uh, as a species, like uh, the human being, and the human condition of the being human, which is a kind of a moral condition with its all existential issues. And this, this merge is a very uh, Western uh, idea. We came to, in some point of uh, European uh, history of thought, which is not shared by the whole, the whole humanity as we can imagine. So I came back to some uh, Chinese uh, old philosophy to investigate how is the status of this humanity animality to, to think about. And then, um, this is interesting because I, I was uh, working with this idea of techniques of the body, the uh, techniques uh, uh, du of um, the French uh, Marcel Most, and then I found a very interesting point of his text when we can see this, um, which is uh, Giorgio Agamben, an uh, anthropologist uh, from Rio de Janeiro, Felipe Susequim, we we'll call uh, anthropological machine like this this uh, operation of division from man for the rest of nature, which is um, here when he says there is no technique and no transmission in the absence of tradition. This, above all, is what distinguishes men from animals: the transmission of techniques and very probably their oral transmission. And here we can find out the the source of the idea that. We can't learn from animals in the proper idea that the animal teaches the technique because the animal itself doesn't have one. And, and then this anthropological machine is what, uh, what Tim Ingold has been working on his, um, in his uh, academic life, so on. And what he would call a logic of inversion, which came to be like the, the, the status quo of our thinking, which is that uh, nature, or if we better call it, the world around us is inanimated. It has no agency, no uh, movement, no, um, no, 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 no uh, a kind of life in the way that we think that we human beings have. And this logic of inversion, uh, he says, has also uh, has much to do with the concept 
of uh, how we think technique and technology. And then he, call, he, he calls the Heidegger problem in the question concerning technology to think that, to say that here uh, in, in Western tradition, we think nature as a gestalt, as uh, a, a composite of uh, inanimate things that we can extract it from it, its, um, its qualities for any purpose that we have. This idea, uh, which he, uh, he's uh, sometimes uh, Philippe Descolai, some other anthropologists would call this um, uh, naturalism, like this uh, Western ontology, is different from the uh, ontology of other uh, cosmovisions. And then we have uh, very recently uh, Yu Kui, uh, a, a Chinese philosopher who also have a uh, uh, background in London and studying philosophy and very other topics. In his question concerning technology in China, he poses the same question that Heidegger did, but to, to inquiry Chinese thought. And then he says that a Chinese thought uh, can be uh, understood as a relational cosmos when uh, we don't have uh, an ontology for each thing separately, but actually all of them are related to this uh, two functions of Tao and Qi, uh, Tao as the, 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 this absolute immanent uh, manifestation, and then this Qi as the tool, uh, the, the, the one that captures the movement of Tao and getting back to the flow. And I probably that um, it's going to make sense in some point. <laughs> and then he goes back to the Han Dynasty to say that this, this kind of a synthesis of uh, Confucianism and cosmologism and then the incorporation of the yin-yang principles as a philosophical matter uh, uh, with qi and other words uh, came in this uh, cons the context of the Han Dynasty when we do have some very interesting points of Chinese uh, thought being confused. Uh, the Chinese philosopher Fang Yulan also uh, uh, he proposed that Chinese thought can be uh, the, the, the classics phase when we have like, the consolidation of the main classics of Chinese thought, and then we have um, uh, the commentarists. Even though we can criti criticize this, this sort of uh, distinction, it's very useful to think that this relational thinking, as Yu Kuei said, or this correlational thinking, as the work from uh, Graham, Needham, Annie Chang, and so on, um, came with this idea that uh, nature, like the Tziran in, in, in Chinese thought, is not nature in a way that we think like the origin of a thing that has a creator or has a starting point, but Tziran is always, can be thought that the things, uh, the, 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 the pattern that goes by itself. And then, um, when he kept this, this whole thing, I, I just found out that if you take a, a, a look in this in the in the long verse of the Chen Wen Qin, uh, a kind of record of the origins of the Chen Tai Chi Chen family that goes through the tradition and attributed to Chen Wen Qin, and then he said, "All that I have less is the the Huan Ting. The, the Huan Ting Jing was a, a Tao a Taoist uh, um, book that um, uses the very concept of the Huan and Si." which is uh, another uh, compilation of the Han Dynasty that merges this Lao Tzu influence with the, the Huan Di uh, um, proposals of to think like the body as a microcosmos of the whole thing and so on. And then when we, we find these relations, we can think that in Chinese uh, 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 way of thinking of this uh, big uh, relational uh, uh, relational thinking, relational way, we don't have like uh, different entities. And then even though we do have a distinction, if you go to Confucius, that the, the Ren uh, cultivates itself by the, the virtue and so on, this distinction doesn't, does not put uh, the animal like apart from, from the world that it's around him. Actually, it's a sort of a kind of relational hierarchy when we do have a relation about human animality and so, but not as different kingdoms as we have in naturalism. And then I go to the, the, the conclusion of my, of my um, argument, which is 
if we happen to understand Chinese martial arts through this lens, you're going to find out that the, the, the imitation of animals, even though sometimes it can be like a very straight, uh, straight synetics of the animal, it's not an imitation, but rather we might think as an emulation or uh, as Douglas Farber poses in his research of praying mantis, like a, a devir, a, a devir from, from the devenire, from the Latin, the Latin. And then we have a kind of a process of becoming when the, the human being unleashes uh, his potential, which, which are the same that animals have, but uh, humans unleash his potential differently from animals. He kind have this technique and this, this, uh, this way of uh, cultivated itself. And then, uh, if we take Yu uh, arguing, it's, it came very, uh, very uh, easy to understand. He calls the, the, the work of Immanuel Kant when Immanuel makes this distinction of the noumenon and the phenomenon. Like the, the noumenos would be like the thing as itself, and the phenomenon, the thing as it appears. And then uh, for Immanuel Kant, which is like kind of a, um, a synthesis of this uh, modern uh, Western thinking, it would be. Uh, science or, or uh, entrepreneur of knowledge all, only can grasp the phenomenon, right? The, the, the phenomenon is a problem of the mystagogia, of the religion, of the, another kind of uh, uh, methods. The science or philosophy, but in his argument, is, can only grasp the phenomenon, right? And then what Yu Hui argues in this, this book that I was just like uh, talking about, that's in Chinese uh, thought, through, through his history from back in the ancient China to the, 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 the outcomes that we have, that we have um, in history, uh, takes a kind of a different um, inspiration that we can uh, apprehend the new meaning by itself through a different process that what another uh, sinologist, the Francois Julien, would call uh, um, a processive capacity. Like, in, if throughout the process, we have like this inversion of uh, understanding that, that lead us to the, the apprehension of the thing itself. And then, uh, so the martial arts may be thought, if you kept the, the contemporary martial arts studies argument, from Daniel Moores and also Douglas Farr and, and Ben Judix, even some fighting scholars that we're, uh, we're talking with here in the Spaniel. Um, martial arts are very related to other practice uh, of artistic and religious uh, manner in ancient China, like painting, like dancing, like philosophy itself, poetry, but also in many other ways to grasp the Tao itself. And this way to grasp the Tao itself, that leads us uh, to think about emulation as Spinoza does. And why, why do I recall with Spinoza? Because he, he has this very interesting concept of emulation, which is when someone uh, moved by the same uh, desire, the same uh, uh, appetite, goes with the same uh, way that the other one who has a shared appetite, a shared desire. So the fighter emulates the animal by putting itself in motion in search of the same qualities that life in its many form, forms presents. In the Chinese relational cosmos, the animal itself also emulates a pattern which takes up the formula of the manifestation of Tao in this yin yang or this wuxing uh, theory. Martial arts, which seems imitative, are actually emulative, is a way of accessing the Tao, this via of integration, as thought with some, some uh, scholars, as Gregory Bateson would recall, like arts as a via of integration with the world. And then um, imitation has no metaphorical characters. It, it, as, uh, even though sometimes the instruction of a master comes like in the formula A is like B, like just like an ego, I follow the argument of Douglas Farr that in Chinese and martial arts, the becoming animal is a manifestation of human powers that comes from the practice, like unleashing process. So um, I know this is a, a very long argument for such a, a, 
short time. So I thank you all for uh, your patience. Even uh, sometimes uh, we can like go straight to the point, even though we have much more uh, fun and understanding if we, if we stop in the topics. But I'm open to questions. If you uh, want to try to contact me, I'm Gabriel Guarino de Almeida. This is my name in Facebook, Instagram, and so on. This is my email where we can uh, continue this conversation. Uh, this uh, draft is going to soon be published, and then I can send it to anyone who is interested to continue, criticize, and think together. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, the time is up, but there are some questions for you in the comment section, so you can answer them. And once again, thank you so much for your speech. Uh, now we will listen to the presentation from Dr. Stefania Skowromankowska from University of Wrocław uh, and Dr. Marta Nowakowska from General Tadeusz Kościuszko Military University of Land Forces. Uh, Dr. Nowakowska will be presenting the speech, but Dr. Skowromankowska is also here with us so she can answer your questions and the title of speech is chinese destinations related to martial arts tourism from the unesco perspective research report okay good morning ladies and gentlemen I hope everyone can hear me. Yes, we can hear you and see you. Okay, great. Okay, I'm in a technologically um, not very well connected to the world. Usually, uh, I have problems with the connections. Okay, right. Um, uh, that's also a technological thing, so I need to put the, my presentation. But I think I will ask you to do it. If you can, please. Okay. This is now working. Okay, so I'll be talking to you and do my speech and ask you to, to change slides. Um, at the beginning, I want to introduce, uh, introduce myself as Dr. Skowron Markowska. You are, you are all um, uh, know. Mm, my name is Marta Nowakowska, as just mentioned. Um, I'm working as an assistant professor at the Military University of Land Forces here in Wrocław. And I'm anthropologist of culture and historian, mm, mostly working on the subject of um, cultural awareness, cultural safety and security, in which we have a national and cultural heritage protection. Mm. And for a long time, myself and Dr. Skowal Markowska were working on the cultural change due to um, globalization. And as a part of it, uh, we wrote together an article that combined uh, martial arts tourism uh, especially in China, with the national heritage protection. And here we are talking about UNESCO perspective. Okay, next slide, please. As I can't change the slide, can you please change the slide?
Okay, thank you. And our research um, mostly done uh, in China itself, but also um, uh, on the documents uh, on the heritage protection. Um, we're going to uh, answer two questions. One, the, uh, the most important, is the status of Shaolin Temple and Changjia uh, Go Village in the context of uh, martial arts tourism and UNESCO documents. To answer this uh, aim, uh, to answer the, the main question we're doing, uh, we have a like, few, we start to asking most general uh, question. So what is the cultural reality? Um, and that's so one of the questions which I can answer from the Western perspective, not the Eastern one. Um, why the, uh, has the culture become a product in the age of globalization, of course? And in fact, what's culture um, authentic uh, city? That's one of the biggest problems when we are talking about national or cultural protection. Um, and our research methods, as you can see on the slide, uh, was interviews and participant observation um, did by Dr. Skobrin Markowska and desk research and analysis of documents uh, done by myself. Next slide, please, if you can. Okay. And to answer our questions, um, we decided to define the phenomena of cultural tourism and uh, one of the kind, the martial arts tourism. Because cultural tourism, uh, we can use to all culture around the world that's connected with Europe, disconnected with Middle East, Far East, Africa, uh, America and most of them uh, Southern or Latin America. Um, and the cultural tourism we can um, name Abdo uh, as one of the oldest forms of travel in the world and one of the fastest growing segments of the tourist market today. People are traveling, uh, but they need a cause and the cause is to understand maybe less but to see the different culture different in uh, most of the time stereotypical um way of thinking um culture in the europocentric way of definition uh, and this tourism um is most of all connected to the local culture influence this culture, uh, become a function of the culture, become an element, one of the uh, basic elements of the culture. It's kind of a message when you can um, reach through the um, culture. It's a kind of uh, encounter between the culture and most of all, tourism is a factor of cultural changes. And that's the moment we need to realize that the culture is change. And why I'm mm, pointing it out? Because uh, these cultu cultural changes are the moment of misunderstanding between original culture, authentic culture, and national heritage or the world uh, cultural heritage. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, and kind of, uh, as I mentioned, kind of a cultural uh, tourism is martial uh, art tourism um, because uh, it's not only to meet to see to check the other cultures, but it's directly connected to the martial arts. Uh, so tourists which are um, decided to go to tour 
to the martial arts places are very motivated, like self-motivated. Uh, they need it for personal or professional education. Uh, and they need it to... Um, I would uh, name it um, find themselves, to understand themselves through connected to other martial arts in the original places. And there are many types of these trips, so so-called subforms of martial art tourism. Uh, and these subforms um, are defined by a different purpose and motivation on the part of the tourists. Um, more uh, on the subject can say um, Dr. Skowron Markowska because she was a person who invest maybe not investigate but did the research uh, in China. Next slide, please. And then we are coming back to the UNESCO World Heritage. Mm. And the, the, the one of the aim of our articles. So what's the connection between martial arts uh, tourism and the UNESCO World Heritage? Mm. Martial art tourists uh, are looking for the origins of the mm, martial arts. They're looking for a master's and they're looking for tradition, they're looking for original thing, they're looking for authenticity. Mm, and UNESCO World Heritage Protection, in fact, uh, decided to uh, one of the organization who is responsible to keep the culture of the heritage alive but as we will see in the next slide, um, a life in the form of the relic, not in the form of the culture. Um, short, very short historical note. Uh, the first uh, convention for protection of cultural property in the event of armed conflicts is 1954, the Hague Convention. Uh, convention. Um, and in fact, all the convention, conventions who, uh, which supposed to protect the uh, world and cultural uh, heritage were written after the Second World War. And in this first convention, uh, we can see there's a mention of cultural property belonging to any people uh, whatsoever means damage to the cultural heritage for all, of all mankind. And then 1972, nah, I'm not going through all the conventions, there are a lot, lot, uh, hundreds in fact of them, but uh, one of the most important uh, data is uh, 1972, when, uh, when UNESCO General Assembly adapted Convention of Protection of World Cultural and Natural Heritage. But the, the first um, moment uh, in this uh, 1970s, uh, cultural heritage uh, were equal to the meaning of uh, monument. So every building, every arche archaeological site, manuscripts, books, um, everything which was um, material you can see you can touch was uh, it was a cultural heritage there was no mention about spiritual um, or social um, side of the heritage next slide please Um, and uh, here we come. Why uh, why the UNESCO uh, stopped and the relic, I would say, uh, stage. Uh, they call it authentic uh, authenticity, and 
authenticity in um, UNESCO concept is totally different thing than we know in, in cultural uh, meaning, especially as an anthropological um, meaning. Um, this is a status of cultural proper, uh, property. Uh, and we need to prevent uh, a need to prevent of historical form and any ty uh, type of falsifications are forbidden so reconstructions um, are not um, accepted by UNESCO uh, 30 years later in 1994 uh, the only document on authenticity is NARA document. Uh, and the NARA document said that the cultural object does not have to uh, meet uh, the condition of authenticity of form and sub, uh, substance, traditional European approach, and yet it can be still recognized as an authentic and inscribed in the UNESCO list. But still, till now, till 2021, um, the definition of authenticity and uh, national uh, heritage on uh, national heritage list is a problem because it you can't uh, measure it in an objective way. This is something you can feel. This is something you can understand, but on, only when you are local person and of course there are levels of authenticity as you can see on the picture I don't want to make it uh, much longer and if something is authentic due to uh, UNESCO you have to describe it you have to um, have a criteria to measure it uh, it has to be traditional. Integrity uh, is uh, European meaning of tradition. Uh, it must be un uh, authentic, and it must uh, have a plan of conservation and management. Next slide, please. And the difference between um, UNESCO uh, authenticity and cultural authenticity. Um, cultural authenticity uh, is connected to culture. And I don't know how many anthropologists are here, but we have to remember that the culture is changing. Okay? Culture never stays on the one level. All the traditional people, all the um, fundamentalists who want to come back to the tradition, so-called traditional values, they have no clue. There's not such a thing as coming back in 100, 200, 500 years for traditional cultural values. Because cult everything that is cultural mm, is evolving. Okay? So we can say the authentic cultural product uh, is an item made by local creator for a traditional purpose. Nah, and in harmony patterns rooted uh, in a given culture. But also, um, we can ask if this item, uh, did in traditional way, um, having traditional meaning and being sold to the tourist, is it still authentic or not? Because the purpose of uh, the intention of making this um, product is totally different. Next slide, please. Okay, and that's the case study we were um, both studying. Um, two places in China, which are already um, mentioned in the World uh, Heritage Protection, UNESCO. Uh, first is Shaolin Temple, and the second one is uh, Zhenjiago. And the first one, the Shaolin Temple, is mentioned is on the list, but only in this uh, material value. So only the buildings are um, and buildings, the landscape 
are um, taking care as a um, world heritage, not a martial arts. And Chen uh is just uh, the, the martial arts, the way the training, this so-called non-material, um, spiritual, social uh, tradition is put on the UNESCO heritage list but not uh, as an object. And our question uh, was why? Where is the border between authentic, authenticism in the UNESCO perspective and uh, cultural authenticity? And um, it is also the matter of fact that we have something like a cultural for sale. So it's the culture for sale, if, uh, really for sale. Shaolin Temple is one of the main goals for martial arts tourists. To practice, to see, to experience. And do they destroying the culture? Do they changing it? In the way, yes, because tourism is one of the most negative thing for uh, um, heritage. But then again, because of the tourism, this uh, place has become more and more viable from the international uh, international society. Should be um, should be described the Shaolin Temple as a relic, which shouldn't be changed because it's authentic or should we watch the process of changing the culture the chinese culture um due to tourism due to tourists we can see um, in this building the traditional building traditional monument uh people are training we can see shows of monks so-called monks. We can buy a gift, the traditional uh, Chinese gift, traditional China weapon as katana. Which I know, that's, that's quite funny, but that's the way it is. Uh, in all uh, places, I would say non-European and oh, not Western or even also Western type, we can buy a culture. And is it wrong or is it right? If someone is uh, um, thinking about authentic authenticity as something traditional, old, um, unchangeable, that is wrong for him. But if you, we think as a culture, and a culture is changing, so maybe the modern culture of Shaolin Temple or Chenjago Temple uh, is the way um, understandable uh, like now, today. Maybe this monk's shows are a part of the culture. Maybe that's the culture we want to protect. Not the, on the old one, the relics. Relics usually stays away from reality. And each year when the ch culture is changing, they, they are just not fitable in the modern world. So maybe we uh, should change our thinking about the heritage, about the culture, and about the tourism. Thank you. Thank you so much for your speech. Uh, we have a long question for you. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think there isn't such thing as classicistic monument because it is a copy of an extinct ancient culture? Uh, is it a copy of what? Because I lost you uh, in my... Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, uh, extinct. Mm -hmm. Extinct, maybe this is my pronunciation wrong. <laughs> extinct. Not a problem. <laughs> an extinct so, uh, ancient culture. Mm -hmm. Um. So the, the, do I, if I understand you right, do I understand, uh, do I, um, I don't appreciate 
uh, monuments of culture which are extinct, uh, extinct already? Uh, no, I think this is a question more about if there is such thing as uh, classical monument, because classicistics actually, uh, because it's okay. a copy of an extinct, extinct uh, <laughs> Asian culture. <laughs> Okay, um, I would say uh, we have to remember that the word monument is a European word. So, um, in European meaning, uh, all the forms of buildings, books, and piece of art are supposed to remind us about cultures which are extinct, extinct uh, which are no... We can't find the, uh, them here now and uh, here and now. I would say, as like a Greek culture, right? We have no connection to ancient Greeks because there is no ancient Greeks. The modern Greeks are. I'm sorry, if there are any Greeks, but that's uh, uh, an expression I heard from my Greek colleagues. Uh, the modern Greeks are not connected. To, culturally and genet uh, by genetics to the ancient one. So we can say that's a monument. That's a monument of the people who are not now and uh, won't be now. But is watching this monument without knowing the Greek philosophy, without knowing the way of life, mm, do we learn something about them or we can see oh they were quite quite smart they make such a big buildings but nothing more so to have a monument like you said um in the meaning of heritage uh to protect this heritage to protect this monument we need to understand culture as whole not as a part like a building or a book so even uh, on the example of Shaolin, okay, Shaolin Temple is a beautiful, beautiful complex of building, but to understand it, we need to understand the culture. And if this culture is changing, I'm not saying the change from like ancient Greek to Greek, but maybe also because um, in Greek example, the Greeks um, choose what to show and how to show it. In uh, Shaolin Temple, Chinese decided what to see, what to show, how to show it, and what uh, it's, I would say, interesting for the people who are coming. I don't know if I answer your question correctly, or I want to know something more. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Stefania, do you have any comments? this presentation because we know you're there <laughs> yes actually i only want to uh, to add that you know testing the different cultures especially in the condition that you are visiting uh, let's say the foreign uh, monastery uh, with a uh, huge culture and a huge expectation for tourists. It, it's not easy. That's why some, you know, some uh, statement can be a little bit, uh, you know, um, well, um, it's not easy to balance the answer. Yes, because the, the question uh, is if, uh, just like Marta said, yes, uh, what can we say about the authenticity of the places, what UNESCO is thinking about it. So when we, as a, let's say the Western researcher, are going to Chinese uh, monastery, we've got also our own expectations about some kind of terms, some kind of uh, impressions. Uh, and it's also, you know, a huge responsibility to leave it outside, leave it back, yes, because we, we cannot take our, you know, baggage of culture to, to examine the things like this. And you always got it inside your head that is part of you. So you have to, you know, leave your shoes and take another one from the Chinese culture if it's possible. But we know it's 
not fully. So yeah, uh, you know, testing authenticity, uh, checking if it's okay, if authenticity is the same or it's according to the rules of the Western countries and we are testing something from Eastern, it's, it's not easy. Uh, that's why some people believe that we still can think that Shaolin Temple is very traditional. And of course it is, it's still the Chinese tradition. But uh, there is also one more thing that we as a tourist, as a people who are live outside, going to China, especially when we going to the monasteries or Shani temples on Chichago villages. And with, for example, if we are martial arts practitioners, we are just waiting for some elements. Yes, we are going to this place and we are searching. Uh, we are searching, let's say, the acknowledges of our expectations. Uh, we are searching the things that we are imagined before. Uh, we've got it in our mind and we are trying to find it just to you know to uh, to make sure that yeah it's, it's like we are we are imagining it. it's like we are thinking about it so that's also one of the risks that we when we're meeting the places like this we also hmm, we've got also a kind of you know uh, impact for those places because when we are the tourists and we are searching for those kinds of things the chinese monks chinese uh, tourist um, uh, teams uh, where which are working there, uh, they are observing us. Yes, they know that, for example, we are searching for authentic Shaolin monk. What does it mean, authentic Shaolin monk? Uh, does it mean that our vision of authentic Shaolin monk is correct? Or the let's say the Chinese monk, it's the authentic monk, yes? Because there is, you know, the, the two, two things. Yes, so if we are, for example, suggest that for us, the Shaolin monk is, let's say, a very fit, skillful person, uh, fighting very well. So uh, just like Marta said, this is a part of selling culture. They will prepare some kind of offer uh, that we will buy in the next time. But is it authentic for us? We don't know, because... This is a kind of, you know, um, selling, yes, for Chinese people. Okay, we know how the um, authentic monk should look like, uh, what she, the authentic monk <clears throat> uh, should represent. But if they believe that this is authentic, okay, we can sell the tickets. Just see your authentic uh, monk, yeah. And, and it's okay. This is also one more thing that for Chinese people, it's not a problem to share uh, this culture like uh, like selling tickets. I don't think it's uh, it's something, uh, you know, offending Chinese people. No, it's okay because we do exactly the same things. Uh, but there is, a, let's say, the, this level of understanding. Yeah, We, we have to take, just take care about the correct understanding. When we are the tourist, we got also a huge impact. And we have to be, you know, uh, aware of the this impact, uh, this let's say influence, sometimes negative, and uh, we have to be, you know, uh, also aware of the fact that we can have very, let's say, um, negative influence also for this kind of culture because the real culture will also always defend um, itself uh, when the product not not always. Thank you. That's all what I would like to add. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much for your speech, uh, Dr. Stefania Skoromakowska and Dr. Marta Nowakowska. Now thank we will you. have a one hour break. Uh, see you at half past 12 p.m. <laughs>